Find, if you would, Ezra chapter number 7. Ezra chapter number 7 will be our text tonight. I'm trying to not do something I've never done in a microphone before, and that's sneeze. All of a sudden, I got hit with a thing here. I'll try to give you some kind of, no, I don't need you to shut it down. It's okay. It'll be more impressive with it up. <laughs> All right. Ezra chapter 7. We finally made it to the chapter that introduces us to the writer of the book. And uh, I got news for you. This is some kind of man. Ezra is a man that was mightily, mightily used of God. Um, the first <clears throat> six chapters dealt with the initial return of the nation of Israel back to Babylon. Um, chapter number six, verse 22 and between chapter 7, verse number 1, if you have a habit of writing in your Bible, you should write somewhere in there 58 to 60 years. Bible scholars tell us that between chapter 6 and verse 22 and chapter 7 of verse number 1, somewhere in the neighborhood of 58 to 60 years have passed in the history of the nation of Israel. Um, Sometimes we just read the Word of God the way it's written, and we don't quite understand the time frame. It's important that you understand the time frame because it's been 50, it's been almost 60 years since the temple has been rebuilt. And that was Ezra chapter 6, verses 16, 17 to the end of the chapter. They celebrated all of that. We looked at a little bit of that last week. Week. We said that the nation was carried away captive in three waves and they were brought back into their land in three waves. Ezra chapter 7 will begin the second wave of the return, led by Ezra. And um, I'm excited to introduce him to you. I'm excited for you to get to see how God uses him in a mighty and marvelous way. Way I got news for you. Um, Ezra was a man that uh, had tremendous impact. When you read about how God used this man and used him in an influential way, and really and truthfully, you could use the word world changer. Ezra was used mightily to change not only his world, but the nation of Israel to impact and to influence them. Remember, this is a man that was born probably in Babylon in captivity. He, he was very successful in Babylon and in the captivity. If you'll, you'll notice as we get here that he has a unique vantage point and he has the king Artaxerxes' ear. Most people feel like Ezra was some kind of diplomat. Um, he's a young man that was born in Babylon. He was successful he grew up in that culture, and even though that Babylonian culture was pagan, and it was anti-God, and we know about that, and you can study that and read that, and even though it was a wicked environment, this man loved the Lord. By the way, let me just talk about environment. I hear this a lot, um, especially when I hear about South Florida. I get this, people say, Pastor, I don't, I don't want to raise my kids in South Florida because of the environment. Um, I've seen people enjoy what they think to be a positive environment, and I've seen people kind of afraid of what they seem to be a negative environment. I've seen people who, who, um, who look at a negative environment and move to what they think to be a positive environment and still turn out negatively spiritually. Um, environment is usually the least of your problems. Adam and Eve were in a pretty good environment. Okay. Evil is around the environment, but evil's inside our heart. So just because somebody lives in a tough environment doesn't mean that God cannot overcome that, meet their need, or use them. Ezra grew up in a pagan Babylonian culture. He grew up amongst, amongst the people that were being chastised for their disobedience, and yet this guy comes out sterling and sparkling and loves the Lord. Um, matter of fact, if you look at verse number six, you're going to see that he was a ready scribe in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given. And so um, 
He, he, he loved the word of God. And that's really what I'm going to talk to you tonight about when we talk about his secret. Um, he's a man who had God's power and was used of God in a mighty way. Look, if you would, at ch- verse number six. Uh, there's a statement in there about two thirds of the way through. It says, and the king granted him all his requests. When we read about what this request is, you're going to find that this was a miraculous moving of God. Um, And God was uh, allowed the king to respond to Ezra in such a positive and amazing way. Um, There's a description of Ezra's life. It's found in verse 27. He lived a blessed life. He lived a life where he wanted to exalt the Lord. He lived a life where he wanted to express his blessing to the Lord. Um, Verse number 28, he says, and I was strengthened. He lived a strong life for the Lord, uh, a blessed life for the Lord. And if you were to ask Ezra, Ezra, what, what was your secret Ezra, how, how, did you, how did you survive this? How did God accomplish all that God wanted to accomplish? And if you could give us a, a secret to some kind of victorious life or a secret to some kind of life of blessing and some kind of life that is strengthened, Ezra, what would be the secret to your success? Look, if you would, at verse number six. At the end of verse number six, you see the phrase, and you might want to underline this now. According to the hand of the Lord, his God upon him. Go, if you would, to verse number nine. The end of verse number nine, it says, according to the good hand of his God upon him. Go, if you would, to verse number 28. As the (coughs) hand of of the Lord my God was upon me. Three times in this one chapter, that phrase is mentioned. That is important. Anytime the Bible mentions something three times, you ought to take note of it. You ought to highlight it. You ought to underline it. Ezra, what what was the secret of your life? How, how, How did God do? How did you have that impact? How did you have that influence? How were you able to have the king's ear? And how were you able to go about it Change not only your life, but the life of the nation of Israel. And Ezra would say, it was because the good hand of God was upon me. And by the way, I don't know about you, but I want God's good hand upon my life. If you do, say amen. We need the good hand of God. Really, really and truthfully, the testimony of our lives is anything that is done for positive is done because of God. And so we have a man here who who was tremendously used of the Lord. We have a man here who who made an impact. You're going to find that you had a man that was a burdened man. And yet, even though he's in this pagan culture, he wants to be used of God. And God does that. By the way, if you want to be used of God, God will use you. Some of the reason the way that God doesn't use people is because they don't want to be used. I want to ask you a question. Do you want to be used by God? And if you want to be used by God, have you told him that? God, use me. Do something with my life. God, in some facet, I, I, I want to bring glory to you. I, I want you to look at my life and I want you to... I want you to do whatever it is you want to do, but but God, I want to be used by you. Pastor, I I, I don't know the Bible well enough to be used. Um, You can learn the Bible. I'll show that in a minute. Pastor, I'm not as gifted as somebody. We can make all kinds of excuses, but the truth is there's not anybody that knows the Lord that God doesn't want to use. God can even use unsaved people. If God can use unsaved people, he should be able to use the Christian. And so he can use you. Ezra was such a man, and he wanted to have such a a burden, and he had such a burden in his life to be used of God. Um, And man, when you read about how God uses Ezra, it's fascinating. Now, 
Um, last week, we, we visited that passage of Scripture where letters were written. And as we've been studying the book of Ezra, we know that Cyrus wrote a letter. There was a letter written to Darius to try to stop the work. Darius writes a letter back to continue the work. And in Ezra chapter 7, verse number 11, all the way to verse number 26, is once again God moving in a mighty and marvelous way. And we learn about this through a letter that is written. Um, and when Ezra was leaving to, to go to the land of Jerusalem, Artaxerxes gives him a letter to take with him. And it's a letter that was some 60 years after the building of the temple, but it's a letter that expresses how God uses Ezra and how God can um, work in the affairs of men. And I just think it's a blessing to read. So let's begin with verse number 11. And I want you to understand this letter. I want you to understand the miracle working power of God and how he takes this man and works in and through him. Now this, verse 11, is the copy of the letter that King Artaxerxes gave unto Ezra the priest, the scribe, even a scribe of the words of the commandments of the Lord and of his statutes to Israel. Artaxerxes, king of kings. There's only one king of kings, but Artaxerxes thought he was. Unto Ezra the priest, a scribe of the law of the God of heaven, perfect peace and at such a time. Artaxerxes says, I make a decree that all they of the people of Israel and of his priests and Levites in my realm, which are minded of their own free will to go up to Jerusalem, go with thee. For as much as thou art sent of the king and of his seven counselors to inquire concerning Judah and Jerusalem, according to the law of thy God, which is in thine hand, and to carry the silver and gold, which the king and his counselors have freely offered unto the God of Israel, whose habitation is in Jerusalem. And all the silver and gold that thou canst find in all the province of Babylon, with the freewill offering of the people and of the priests, offering willingly for the house of their God, which is in Jerusalem, that thou mayest buy speedily with this money, bullocks, rams, lambs, or meat offerings, or drink offerings, offer them up upon the altar of the house of your God, which is in Jerusalem. And whatsoever shall seem good to thee and to thy brethren to do with the rest of the silver and the gold that do after the will of your God. The vessels also that are given thee for the service of the house of thy God, those deliver thou before the God of Jerusalem. And whatsoever more shall be needful for the house of thy God, which thou shalt have occasion to bestow, bestow it out of the king's treasure house. If you don't have enough money, I'll pay for more. And I, even I, Artaxerxes the king, do make a decree to all the treasurers which are beyond the river, that whatsoever Ezra the priest, the scribe of the law of the God of heaven, shall require of you, it be done speedily. Unto a hundred talents of silver, to a hundred measures of wheat, to a hundred baths of wine, to a hundred baths of oil, salt without prescribing, how much? Whatsoever is commanded by the God of heaven, let it be diligently done for the house of the God of heaven. Now here's the king's motive. For why should there be wrath against the realm of the king and his sons? So he, he wanted God's favor. He wasn't the saved man, but he, uh, he wanted the favor of all gods and in this one as well. Also, we certify you that touching any of the priests and Levites, singers, porters, nethanims, or ministers of this house of God, it shall not be lawful to impose toll, tribute, or custom upon them. All the way back then, they didn't tax the church or didn't tax those situations. And thou, Ezra, after the wisdom of thy God that is in thine hand, set magistrates and judges which may judge all the people that are beyond the river, all such as know the laws of thy God, and teach ye them that know them not. And whosoever will not do the law of thy God and the law of the king, let judgment be executed speedily upon him, whether it be unto death or to banishment or to confiscation of goods or to imprisonment. Wow. Can you say blank check? <laughs> Basically, <clears throat> the king said to Ezra, here's a blank check. Go do what God wants you to do. By the way, if you don't have enough to do it, I'll help you do it. And this is the, this is the third time now 
we have seen God use a pagan king to benefit and bless his people. And he's stirred their heart and he's put it in their heart. And this time he stirs Artaxerxes using Ezra, not Zerubbabel, as Zerubbabel was prior to that, but Ezra here. And, and God uses him, Ezra, to, to, to be able to work in and for the king. By the way, just let me say this. Um, I think God allowed Ezra to have his job for such a time as this. Be careful when God blesses you to be faithful to do what God wants you to do. When God puts you in a place of influence, you need to exercise influence. When God puts you in a place of, of uniqueness, then God has a plan for you. None of us in this room put ourselves anywhere by ourselves. Everything we are and everywhere we are is because of what God has done in our lives. So God has allowed Ezra this blessing. Ezra is a burdened man. He's a man that, that wants to be used of God. He's a man that has an opportunity for influence. He presents his request to the king and the king in charge just issues the man a blank check for him to go and to serve the Lord. I don't know about you, but I want to go back to my statement. I want to be used by God. If you do say amen. amen. So pastor, I, I, I want God to do that kind of stuff in my life. I, I, I want God to do miraculous stuff in my life. I, I, I want God to do things that, that can't be explained by my intellect or my ability or my decision. I, I want him to use me on an upper level. Can God do that? Yeah, he can. But there's something in the life of Ezra where I'm about to take you that I really do believe is the secret of, 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 of all the believer's life. And it's going to be simple to you. You're going to hear it and you're going to think, I already know this. But I'm begging you to not say you already know this. Look, if you would, at verse number 10. For Ezra had, what's that word? Prepared. The Bible goes on to say that he prepares his heart. Now I got news for you. God does not use unprepared people. God does not use unprepared prepared people. The reason most Christians sit on a pew and, and never see God do in their life what God did in a man like Ezra's life is not because Ezra is better than you or better than me. We're all sinners. But the reason that God works on a certain level with some and on others, really and truthfully, Boils down to preparation. You, 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 you can't just go about life on an intellectual, physical, ethical work level and think that I'm naturally prepared for spiritual work. Spiritual work demands spiritual preparation. Okay? Now, write this phrase down. I've given it to you before. Preparation is paramount to preventing the enemy. Preparation is paramount to preventing the enemy. If I do not prepare myself spiritually at the beginning of every day, I am vulnerable to the enemy on a level that, that, that is usually on a, on a failure level. And Ezra, even though he's in a captive land, 
even though he's living amongst the people that are that are disobedient and being chastised for their disobedience. And even though that Ezra really and truthfully has a dream that, that God has to do something or the dream's not going to come to fruition. And even though the environment is against him, Ezra is still preparing himself. He's still doing the work that's needed to be do, done so that God can use him. Um, and, and if you look at verse number six, the Bible says that he was a ready scribe in the law. That word ready is the word skilled, a skilled scribe in the law. Um, and, and if you're going to be skilled at something, it's going to demand practice. And so here you have Ezra and Ezra is in an environment and a situation where he's wanting God to do something. He's in a negative environment per se, but he's still preparing himself. He's still being skillful. He's still working at that so that he's ready when the time comes. How did he prepare his heart? There's three things in verse number 10 that are how he prepared his heart. They fit together. You, you can pull them right out of the text. Here we go. For Ezra had prepared his heart to... What's that word? Seek the law of the Lord. So you could write the word, know the Bible. Ezra prepared his heart and prepared himself by knowing the word of God. Write the word study by that point. Number two, he prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to what? To do it. So not only did he know the Bible, but he also made an effort to do the Bible. Write the word obey. He studied and he obeyed. And then at the end of that, it says not only did he prepare his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it, but to what? Teach. If you're going to teach, you're going to apply. Teaching is applying. Teaching is making application and illustration. And so here, here is Ezra, this man that, that had a tremendous burden, this man that God used in a mighty and wonderful way where God's power was on him. The king granted him a blank check. This man who was uh, strong in the Lord, who reckoned the good hand of God upon his life. And really and truthfully, before that manifested itself, Ezra had prepared himself and he prepared himself around the word of God. Um, I, I think I can exclude present company because you're here on a Wednesday night and you love the word of God. But I'm going to tell you something. The reason that our Christian church people are getting destroyed is because we are wordless. We're wordless as a church. Um, we can work, churches can worship and they can wow and they can work and they can wahoo and they have wealth. But most churches are so wordless that God's people don't, don't know what to do. That's why the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts he, he said those people at Berean, they were more noble because they, they opened up the scriptures and they searched things out. I'm going to tell you something. You cannot afford to be a wordless Christian. So how much time are you spending in God's word? Most people think that preparing themselves to be used of God has something to do with, with training or service or something like that. But being prepared centers around the Word of God. It centers around studying the Word of God, knowing the Word of God. Listen, 
You would be amazed at the knowledge that the Bible brings to a person's life. If you would agree with that, say amen. amen. The, 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 the knowledge on all levels. So Ezra here, he's preparing himself and he's reading the word of God. I'm going to take you to a passage of scripture that I think Ezra did write. Some Bible scholars have different things and we're not sure, but I believe the man did write this passage and, and I'm going to show you how practical it is in our life, in his life, and how practical it will be in our life, because I'm not sure that God's people really realize the practicality of the Word of God. And so Ezra prepared it by knowing the Bible. Do you know the Bible? So let me just ask you some very simple questions. How many, don't answer out loud. How many books are in the Bible? I said, don't answer out loud. <laughs> the Bible's divided into two sections. How many books are in the old one? How many books are in the new one? Who wrote the first five books of the Bible? What are they called? If I wanted to learn how to praise the Lord. What book of the Bible would I go to? If you wanted to learn how to, how to, something about your marriage, what book of the Bible would you go to? If you wanted to learn about the end times, what book of the Bible would you go to? If you, if you wanted to learn about the Lord Jesus in his earthly walks, where would you go? How much of the Bible do you know? Do you have a favorite verse? Do you have a life verse? What do you know about the Bible? See, I think if it was honest, we love the Bible we would worship the Word of God. It's important and valuable, but do we know it? By the way, you can know the Word of God because if you are a Christian, the Spirit of God lives in your heart. Now, you need to understand something about the work of the Holy Spirit. Nobody understands the Bible out of your physical capabilities. Okay? Now, I've got to read it, and I've got to be able to digest it, but the Bible says that the Spirit of God is the illuminator of the Scripture. He guides us into all truth. I'll say a couple things. You may disagree with this, but this will, this will be, at least you know your pastor's heart. That one of the reasons that we use the, the King James Bible is because we believe it to be the best translated Bible we have. I believe personally that one of the reasons that there is an authority on this pulpit, not, your, not me, there's an authority on this pulpit in the preaching of this ministry, whoever does it, is because we, we use this Bible. I think it has power and authority to it. Amen. So when somebody comes to me and they say, well, pastor, I want to use something different because it's easier to understand, I, I immediately know that they don't understand. I never read the Word of God without bowing my head and saying, now, Lord, hold, oh, please, Father, allow the Holy Spirit to teach me, illumine to me the Word of God. If you're getting nothing out of your Bible reading, do you stop and ask God to teach you to know it? Ezra became skilled in the law of God. He began to know the Word of God. And as he read that Old Testament, he read those historical, he knew about his people. He knew about what they had lost. He knew about where they had been. He knew all the promises and this wisdom is getting, and he's getting ready and skilled and eager to go. And he knew the Word of God. How much time do you spend reading the Word of God? Second thing he did was he obeyed the Word of God. He obeyed it. By the way, he did the Bible. He, he, uh, and that was recognized by the king in, in verses seven and 11, or chapter 7, verses 11 to 14. 
It's no good to read the Bible if you're not going to obey the Bible. Be ye doers of the word and not what? Here's only. So as I'm preparing myself to be used of God, if I'm preparing myself to have God's power in my life, if I want God to use me, where do I go to get prepared, Pastor? You go to the book. You go to the book. And then you obey the book. And then as we're able to apply the book and teach the book, I begin to take what I know, I begin to obey where I need to obey, and then I begin to teach and apply what I've learned to the issues of life. That, that enables me to have a biblical worldview. That enables me to look at things the way that God wants to look at things. That enables me to see truth. I don't know about you, but has anybody else ever thought about, it is a miracle and a wonderful blessing to be able to know truth. We know the truth. There are people tonight, and they're outside of this building, man, and they're just doing their life. If they drop dead, bam, immediately, if they don't know Christ, they're in hell. I know the truth. You know the truth. We're saved people. Think about the privilege of walking in the light. Think about the privilege of knowing Christ and all of that kind of, all that, that comes with that. What a blessing to know the truth. But I'm not sure that we're applying the truth to the biblical, to the, to, the, to the practical parts of our life. And so Ezra, being used of God, prepared himself. He knew the Bible. He obeyed the Bible. And he applied the Bible. By the way, it's absolute truth. Amen? So here's what I find. I'm finding people that that been saved a long time. And they'll come and they'll ask questions. And I'm thinking, you should know the answer to this question. It's in the Bible. Or, or I'm watching people take worldly perspective and apply it to their daily life. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why would you do that? Why wouldn't you put a biblical perspective to this in preparing our hearts? Now, I, I want to show you. I got a few moments left. I, I want to show you. And I can't do the whole thing. God helped this statement to come out right. I want to show you how the word of God touches every area of your life. Go to Psalm 119. How many verses are in Psalm 119? A lot. Good answer. It's the longest chapter in the Bible. Bible scholars have some doubts and disagreements as to who wrote this psalm. Ezra is one of the men that they believe may have written this psalm. When I listen to this psalm and listen to how it unfolds in our life or unfolds on the, in, on the paper, I could see Ezra writing this. Now, what you need to know about Psalm 119 is it is a psalm about the Bible. Okay, are you with me? I got you, right? You're hanging on every word I'm saying. Now you are, all right? Eight words are used like testimony, precept, law, scripture. Eight different words are used throughout Psalm 119 to refer to the Bible. As you read and study this passage, this, this chapter this week, you are going to be amazed at the moments of your life that are tied to the Word of God. You're going to be amazed at the, at the subjects that all find their, their answer and their power and, their, and, and, and our responsibility to the Word of God. And, and, and what I want to do tonight is I, I just want to tell you that this scripture is alive in the living word of God. Look, if you would, at verse number one. I'm just going to take a few moments here and read through some of these. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. 
So if you want a blessed life, say amen. amen. So according to verse number one, if you want a blessed life, where are you going to walk? In the law of the Lord. That means that as I walk my life in the scriptures, blessing awaits me. Verse number two. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies. There's the obedience. I better know the Bible in verse number one. I better know how to walk. Verse number two, as I obey the Bible, I'm blessed. And that seek him with the, say those two words. So, so let me ask you a question. And I'm asking myself this question. Do I really dive into the Bible with my whole heart? With my whole heart. Um, have you ever given your whole heart to anything? Not someone. To anything. Are you an avid, ha, do you have a hobby that you're avid at? Are you a book reader? Are you a novel reader? Are you a movie watcher? Are you a discoverer? Are you a researcher? You know, we give our whole hearts to certain things. But if I'm going to give my whole heart to the Word of God, ask yourself a question. Have, am I giving my whole heart to the Word of God? Verse number three. They also do no iniquity that walk in his ways. What does that mean? That means that it corrects my behavior. It enables me to obey the Lord. It enables me to be blessed of God. Verse 4, thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. Here's the cry of his heart. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. So I, I want to be obedient. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all thy commandments. I will praise thee with uprightness of heart. When, it shall, when I shall have learned thy righteous judgment, I will keep thy statutes. Forsake me not utterly. Here's a wonderful beginning in this uh, psalm to the foundation of the word of God. I have all kinds of verses that are underlined in Psalm 119 in my Bible. I don't know if you do or not. But I'm just going to kind of cherry pick a little bit here. And I'm going to send you out of here with some homework. I want you to live in Psalm 119 till next Wednesday night. I want you to read it every day. Pastor. That's, that's bigger than the daily bread. <laughs> Every day. If you've ever done a counseling session with me, you know I have a little thing that I do. I want you to read that Bible with a piece of paper and with a pen. And I want you to read. And as you read the word of God, the subject. The, that you're dealing with, the moments that you find yourself in, your fear, your relationships, I promise you that there is an immense amount of your life in Psalm 119 tied to the Word of God. And I want you to take your paper, and so you would take Psalm 119, verse number one, and you would say, if I want a blessed life, I should walk in the law of the Lord. You'll go on through. Look at verse number nine. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Um, I use this verse to help me with my thought life. Do you have, have you seen things you wish you'd have never seen? I'll talk to men a little bit here. Men. A man's mind is an amazing, I know women won't think this, but it's an amazing thing. <laughs> and your heart can want righteousness and your mind can be dominated by filth. And what a man sees, a man cannot forget. So how does a man Wash his mind. The only way you wash your mind is you wash your mind by the word of God. 
And as I wash my mind with God's word, I have found that now when my mind, it runs to the word of God. To the word of God. And I have, I have found that things that I tried to forget and wanted to forget a long time. It took me till I was in high school to learn this verse. My mind could be cleansed. And there's nothing greater than the cleansing of the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? It's tied to the word of God. Verse number 11. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Do you have a habitual sin, women? I already got the men. Let me get the women. Do you have a habitual sin? Uh, it's called a besetting sin in the book of uh, Hebrews. It's called a weight in our life. Pastor, I have a habit that I cannot break. Sure you can. You can break it with the word of God. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. I got some other ones underlined. Look at verse 23. Princes also did sit and speak against me. You have somebody saying some evil things about you. If you're in the ministry or you're in work with people, you're going to need this verse. Princes did sit and speak against me, but thy servant did rip off their head and spit down their neck. No. But thy servant did meditate in thy what? Statutes, which is a word for the word of God. So are you sitting there staying up night because you think so-and-so said this about you at work and this is going on about you and you know that these people over here and they're talking about you and they're scheming and they're planning about you. And so how do you survive that? You meditate on the word of God. Pastor, it doesn't work. You don't work. I don't work. This works. Let's keep going. We got a couple more minutes. It gets better. Um, um, oh, look at verse 71. I don't like this one, but I underlined it. <laughs> it is good for me that I have been, what class? Afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. Have you been afflicted? Are you afflicted at work? Are you afflicted in a relationship? Have you been afflicted by your child, by your wife, by your husband, by your parents? Are you under some kind of physical affliction? The psalmist said, it's good for me that I've been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. Where do you go when you get upset? Where do you go when you get misused? Where do you go when somebody's offended you? If you go into your human nature, you're going to rage and you're going to get angry. Ezra said, if he wrote this, he said, listen, it's good for me that I've been afflicted because it brought me to the word of God. Anything that brings me to the word of God in my life is good. In everything give. Um, look at verse number 97. Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. You know, we think about a lot of things during the day. But the word of God ought to be the meditation of our day. I'll finish with verse 165 and I'm done. One of my favorite verses in the Bible. Great peace have they which love thy law and nothing shall Say it. Offend them. Do we live in, a, in an offendable world? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We live in an... I got an email, kind and gracious email. I offended some people, and I didn't even mean to offend some people. I, I can understand. I did it. I offended them. I was wrong. I didn't mean to do it. Sometimes people offend me. Sometimes people offend you. But the Bible says, great peace have they which love thy law and nothing shall offend them. 
So, so let me just help us with this. If you're easily offended, it's evidence you're wordless. If you're easily offended, it's evident you're wordless. Psalm 119 takes our life and anchors it on the book. And there's no better place to be than on the solid rock of God's word. Amen. If you'll do the study, you'll be blessed. And I'll have a sticker for you next Wednesday night. Let's have our prayer.